If you think back about 20 years ago, you'll remember that it was a very challenging time for media law in Canada. Libel and defamation laws were seriously outdated, and we saw freedom of expression cases often lose ground in court due to precedents that hurt journalism. What journalists needed was an organization dedicated to the protection and enhancement of freedom of expression. Enter three cape crusaders, or maybe I should say gowned crusaders, because they were all lawyers, Dan Henry and Brian Rogers in Toronto, and Marc-André Blanchard in Quebec, who answered the call and formed the Canadian Media Lawyers Association, also known as Ad Edom. Of course, it didn't happen by magic. Dan Henry had to persuade and cajole and hector and wheedle and demand that lawyers come together. Turns out, those are his superpowers because the resulting organization has made a huge difference for every media organization and every journalist here. I was a little shocked like you were with the number 55. I can't imagine where we'd be without this organization. Dan brought that same tenacity to his time at CBC, where he fearlessly navigated the legal hurdles that helped journalists get their stories to air. Dan Henry has been involved in almost every major legal battle to extend the media coverage of the courts in particular and freedom of expression overall. Dan was also involved in one of the most important rulings by the Supreme Court of Canada on free expression under the Charter, which was overturning the ban on broadcasting CBC's film, The Boys of St. Vincent. And for a man, I figure he must have been pretty good at the petite, petite, petite details on that case. And so, for his lifelong commitment to promoting and defending media freedom, Dan Henry is this year's recipient of the Vox Libera Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Henry. Thank you, Denise, for those very kind remarks. I'm going to put fearless navigator of legal hurdles on my new business cards. <laughs> I want to thank CGFE for this award. I feel very honored, truly, to receive it, especially among my fellow honorees tonight. I didn't get here by myself. I want to recognize all my colleagues in the CBC Law Department, and particularly Jerry Flaherty, who hired me and set a fine example, and Michael Hughes in the Toronto office, who provided constant and good-humoured support in everything we faced together. At the time I joined CBC in 4 BC, <laughs> before the Charter, a colleague was helping Lyndon McIntyre take a case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. The court's decision dramatically improved public access to search warrants. Lyndon's gumption and the whole exercise was inspirational to me. I quickly discovered that at CBC he was not alone. There were and are many dedicated, courageous, and inspirational people there with whom I was proud to work but am too afraid to start naming here. I'd never stop. I enjoyed every day and every night, and every day and every night, I was privileged to be at CBC. I see a lot of familiar faces here tonight. I can't tell you how many times I also found myself helping journal journalists working for other media organizations who piggybacked on our access applications, needed guidance in cases we were all caught up in or cooperated in our common efforts to fix media law. I want to thank Brian Rogers and Marc-André Blanchard, now Justice Marc-André Blanchard who co-founded Ad Edom with me, and the rest of the media lawyers across Canada who add their intellect, instinct, and passion to the cases we've given them and convince judges to make judgments that form a strong fabric of free expression law here. You know, at times like this, when we are confronted powerfully and directly by the heart-wrenching difficulties foreign journalists like those honored here tonight 
face in other parts of the world. We know we're blessed to be able to live in a country with the liberties we enjoy. And a strong judicial system to uphold and refine our constitutional rights. But even our history, our history has shown that we can't take our rights for granted. In practice, our system depends on citizens like us asserting our rights for serious consideration. The gala blurb on me describes me as an optimist. As if the fact that I'm still predicting camera access to court in my 30th year of fighting for it somehow qualifies me for that title. I see myself very much as a realist. I've read the Charter and countless cases that interpret it. Freedom of other media of communication is explicitly protected there in Section 2B. And just last year, the Supreme Court of Canada confirmed in the CBC case that media reporting from court proceedings is protected expression. Judges can simply no longer act as if those words are not there. Here we are, 30 years after I began speaking about this. Supreme Court of Canada proceedings are now webcast and available on demand online. Many appellate courts have done experiments and all have been successful. We've had cameras in a number of trial courts, here and there, again, without incident. What we need is a routine and presumed audiovisual access to trial courts where judges decide on the basis of a Dagenet test whether it's necessary, necessary to limit that coverage and only limit it to the extent necessary. That means continuing to protect the identities of vulnerable witnesses, but it doesn't mean giving every party and witness the power of consent, which is actually a power of veto over public access to public proceedings. Cameras will come more often to trial courts. Cameras are everywhere. There are probably 500 of them in this room tonight. <laughs> Smartphones and tablets, as you know, are a fact of modern life and are not going away. I suspect some of you are recording tonight's proceedings without our permission. <laughs> that is okay, that's your right. I've been asked to comment recently about using Twitter in court. Twitter serves an important function, connecting people to each other and to events of significance to them in real time. But this new debate brings me full circle to where I began. Let me ask you, what is better? Having a frenzied reporter in court limited to banging out the questions, answers, and legal argument in 140 character bursts in coded and often confusing tweets? Or freeing up that reporter? from being a harried and hurried scribe to being someone who lets an audio or audiovisual recording capture all that information accurately and efficiently in real time while he or she listens, analyzes, crafts reports that cover the case well, and then links his tweets to those accurate recordings. Historically, Historically, trials were designed to be a public forum where all citizens could be the jury and determine justice. That role was delegated to a 12-person jury, but citizens retained the right to see and hear what their fellow citizens have to say under oath as it's being said. Today, when citizens can have direct access to that electronically, and the justice system denies that to them. It's just not, in a modern sense, open justice. And it's just not good enough. When we're denied the ability to see and hear judges sentence an offender and give their reasons publicly, it's just not good enough. When we're denied the ability to see and hear legal arguments in any court, any court, trial courts included, on matters of public interest, it's just not good enough. When we're denied the ability to see and hear testimony of police officers who've investigated a crime and report to court and to all of us, to the public, on oath, what they've discovered, it's 
not just, it's just not good enough. I don't believe anyone applied to televise the testimony of Mayor Ford in his recent libel trial and conflict of interest trials. But when virtually everything else he says is available on camera, we should have been able to see and hear his testimony in the normal course. We've had thousands of witnesses now testify on camera in multiple inquiries on the most sensitive subjects over three decades. And no one, no one is suggesting they didn't tell the truth there. Our judges have had a blind spot when it comes to the merits of audiovisual access. At the recent Ryerson conference reviewing the charter at 30 years old, Justice Gomery attribu attributed this attitude to judicial cowardice. He may be right. Whatever the reason for it, it's time, constitutionally and practically, for judges to take another look at making it happen. So my message to trial judges, you are masters of your own courts, you are independent. Let the public see and hear the great work that you do. End your audiovisual isolation, connect to Canadians, and join the modern society you serve. You're presiding over public proceedings, after all. Embrace and exploit the medium's potential. Webcast your own proceedings, at least those you consider to be of public interest. The cost is now minuscule, and a working system is simple to set up. Many of us here in this room can help you, uh, can show you how. It's in your interest and in the interests of justice. And if you want, offer a familiar warning to all who participate in the proceedings. You may have heard this before. You may be recorded for quality assurance and training purposes. <laughs> we'll all understand. As for journalists, in every case you cover, every day, Ask for audiovisual access, well in advance if you can. And if every journalist in Canada does this, judges will eventually grant that access to you. Don't be afraid to stand up for your rights. If you don't, who will? Thank you.